Well, I am excited uh, for today. We have been in the last few weeks in the various services that I've been uh, preaching at, we've been covering a series on wise choices. And as we've been going through this series, we've been looking at what wise choices are, what, uh, why are wise choices so important? I mean, after all, when we make decisions, oftentimes the decisions are personal decisions. Uh, we don't need to uh, ask anyone else their thoughts on what I decide for my own personal life. But we saw at the very beginning that our personal decisions don't stay personal to us. They don't stay in our life. Oftentimes, our decisions will uh, spread out and affect the lives of those around us, either for good or for ill. And we also also saw uh, in our uh, last part when we were talking about wise decisions, we saw uh, four key questions that we should ask ourselves whenever we're facing uh, decisions, whether they be big or small. And as we ask those questions that we saw in God's word, uh, those will help guide us and direct us to making the, the wisest decisions in our life. And I know that's the, the hope, that's the goal for each and every one of us. We all want to be people who make wise decisions. But here's the thing that I also know about each and every one of us. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. And as much as we want to make good decisions, we don't want to make a mess of our life. We don't want to make decisions that hurt us and hurt those around us. But here's the thing. We will make poor decisions. I'm going to, not only have I made poor decisions, I'm sure that in the days ahead, maybe even before I get home today, I will probably make a poor decision. And you've probably made poor decisions this past week. You can think about uh, decisions you've made maybe even here this year, and you think, man, what in the world was I thinking? But here's the thing. We will make poor decisions, but what's more important than, than whether or not we will make them is what are we going to do with those poor decisions? When you mess up, when you uh, make a decision that is unwise, that is foolish, that goes contrary to what God's will for your life is, what do you do on the other side of that? Because here's the thing. Some people, they make poor decisions, and then they just keep going forward. They don't learn from their past mistakes. They don't learn from the the scars and bruises they they have accumulated over the years. They just continue to make the foolish decision after foolish decision, reaping negative consequences. You probably even know people like that. As I say that, you probably have faces that come to your mind of individuals in your life. Maybe they're your family members. Maybe they're your coworkers. Maybe they're your boss. Maybe they're a neighbor. And you see they are constantly making unwise decision after unwise decision, never learning along the way what they're doing to cause so much hurt and heartbreak in their life and the lives of those around them. Now, what I don't want you to do today is I don't want you to be thinking about those other people. I want you to be thinking about when do I do that? When do I make poor decisions and then I don't learn from them? Because here's the thing, when we don't learn from our poor decisions, when we don't turn those over to God, and when we don't uh, uh, recalibrate the direction that we're uh, going in life, then we can remain stuck. Yes, you may be a Christian. Yes, your eternity is secure in Christ Jesus. But you can cause untold devastation in your life and the lives of those around you if you don't pause and take to God all of the, the past Uh, hurt and scars and poor decisions that you've accumulated throughout your life, lay them before his feet and ask God, God, teach me. God, refine me. Help me take this this stuff that I've uh, accumulated in my life, and God, help me give that over to you. Because here's the beautiful thing about God. He loves to take our poor decisions and turn them into something beautiful. He loves to take the foolish decisions that I've made in my life and and take them and wash them in the blood of Jesus Christ and use them to glorify himself and to do great things in the lives of his people. So what I want us to do today is I want us to focus on those past decisions that you've made and how can we make peace with them? How can we bring them before God and not carry them around with us, not allow them to define our lives going forward, but how can we give those over to God, make peace with them, and allow God to use those for his glory and for his kingdom. So if you have your copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Psalms, and we're going to be looking in Psalm 51. Psalm 51, and in Psalm 51, what we're going to see is we're going to see three important insights of how you can be at peace with your past decisions, whatever those past decisions may be. 
we will look at King David, a man after God's own heart who made some poor decisions in his life. And in Psalm 51, he is writing out his prayer to God, and he is calling out to God to help him reconcile his poor decisions with what God's will for his life is. And there are many insights that we can find in there, but there are three key insights that I want you to be able to take home with you today and begin thinking through and praying through these uh, three particular truths that we see in Psalm 51 and how they can help you make peace with your own past decisions. The first thing that I want us to see here in Psalm 51 is that you and I need to accept responsibility for our decisions. Now, I'll pause here for just a moment before we dive into the passage because that is a loaded uh, statement that I've just given you. I want to make sure we flesh it out before we get deep into what God's Word says here. We need to accept responsibility for what we decide in our life. Now, when I talk about responsibility, here's the definition that I found that I think really hits the closest to what responsibility truly is. Responsibility is defined as being accountable to something within your power, control, or management. The reason why I needed to define that for us today is because we live in a culture that doesn't like to accept responsibility for their own decisions. We are increasingly seeing a culture all around us where people are are blaming everyone else for what's going on in their life. Well, it's my mom's fault, or it's my dad's fault, or it's my employer's fault, it's my friend's fault, it's the, it's the society that I've grown up in. It's everyone else. It, maybe it's even God's fault. He, he uh, put me here at this time in this place with all these challenges and all these difficulties, and so I can't help the direction my life is going. I can't help the choices I've had to make. If, you, if, if we were to bring them up here and them tell their story, maybe even some of us would begin to sympathize with them and say, you know what, maybe they got a point. Maybe they can't help the direction their life is going. Maybe they can't help some of the choices they've had to make. But see, what we need to understand is that from Genesis to Revelation, God has shown us that people created in the image of God are responsible for the choices we make. I'm not saying those choices are going to be easy. I'm not saying they're going to be fun or they're they're not going to have a, a ton of pain attached to them. But God holds each and every one of us accountable for the decisions that you and I make. You know, here recently, I, uh, I was listening to the radio, and there was a, a new book that has just come out. And its, its title is In Defense of Looting. Now think about that for a moment. You've seen all over the news, you've seen where cities are burning to the ground, where people are smashing businesses and looting whatever they want, and now instead of condemning it, there are people actually defending it, saying that it's right, that it's okay, because those people are not responsible for their decisions. Listen, that is contrary to everything God's Word says. And here's the thing that I want you and I to understand, and I want us to really focus in on our own life and our own heart in this, in this particular moment. You need to understand that as long as you continue to point the finger at someone else and blame someone else, whoever they may be, you will remain stuck where you are. God wants to do something incredible in your life, but until you begin to accept responsibility for what you have done and what you have chosen in your life, you will remain stuck. And thankfully, we see in David, when he made poor decisions, he was quick to go to God and accept responsibility for what he had done. I want you to notice in verse, uh, verse, starting in verse 1 of Psalm 51, this is what David said, have mercy upon me. Now, if you underline, I just encourage you, write, underline or highlight every time you see David confessing something about himself. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when, just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, 
I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Here we see over and over and over again in, in verses 1 through 6, you see David continually confess, Look, go, God, this is my transgression. This is my sin. I'm the one who has sinned against you. Lord, I was born in sin. I have been born with a, a heart that is inclined to run from you. And God, as much as I would love to blame the, the pressures of being king, Lord, I would love to, to, to give excuse after excuse of, of how it's not my fault. She shouldn't have been bathing up on the rooftop or, you know, Uriah shouldn't have been off at war. David stood before God and said, I, I'm guilty for this. He's referencing the, the sin where he took Uriah's wife Bathsheba, and he laid with her, and then sent Uriah off to his death. And as king, what could anyone do about it? But David knew there was no justification for his decision. I once heard it said that when we rationalize our poor decisions, all we're doing is telling rational lies to make ourselves feel better. And how often I've been guilty of that, and how often each and every one of us have been guilty when we feel the shame, the guilt, and the effects of our poor decisions, we're so quick to point the finger at someone else. And this is natural to each and every one of us. This is not something that anyone has ever had to teach us. We see all the way back in Genesis when Adam and Eve first committed the very first sin of the human race, and God confronted them on it. What did he do? Adam pointed to Eve. Eve pointed to the serpent, and everyone just kept pointing the finger at someone else. And if you go throughout uh, uh, biblical history and you go throughout human history, you'll constantly see people with the natural inclination to point their finger at somebody else. But it's only when we accept responsibility and confess our sins to God that we can begin moving forward with his will for our lives. So I want to ask you a question. I don't want you to raise your hand. I don't want you to nudge anyone else, but I want you in just the stillness of this moment to ask God to reveal something very important to each and every one of us. I want you to ask, who am I blaming for my decisions? What person in your life have you been pointing the finger at constantly for the, the, the difficulties and the hardships and the negative consequences in your life? Who have you been pointing the finger at? Has it been your parents? Has it been a bully at school? Has it been, you know, that person that you had dated for a number of years? Has it been that ex-spouse who just uh, made your life miserable? Is it your coworker? Is it your boss? Is it the politicians and the leaders in our society? Is it God? Who have you been pointing the finger at? And I just want to challenge you here for a moment. Instead of looking elsewhere for the difficulties and struggles that you're facing in your life, I want you to ask, is there anything that I have done to contribute to this situation? Is there anything that I have done to contribute? What piece of the pie do I need to take ownership of? You know, I haven't been pastoring very long, but in the years that I have been pastoring and in the, the couples that I've spoken to in, in marriage counseling, I have yet to come across a single couple who's come into my office because they've been dealing with struggles in their, in their marriage, who, who one of the couple have said, you know what, it's all my fault. I've done it all. I'm the one, I've been telling lies, or I've been doing this, I've been the one losing my temper, it's all me. You know what I tend to find? The husband blaming the wife, and the wife blaming the husband, and everyone pointing fingers at everyone else. But listen, those marriages never heal until each person takes ownership of what they've done. And in the same way, whatever it is that you are dealing with, whatever it is that you're struggling with, you'll never move forward. You'll never be able to experience all the blessings that God so desperately wants to pour into your life until you begin accepting responsibility for what you have chosen and what you have done. That's not a popular message in today's churches. That's not a popular message in today's society. But listen, that should not surprise us as Christians. This is the very first step in our process, in our, in our journey towards salvation. When we were sinners apart from God, the very first thing that God asked us to do is to confess our sins, to turn towards him. 
to realize that I've made a mess of my life and only he can save me? Where in the world do we get the idea as Christians that once I've, ex- I've asked God and confessed my sins, that after that point, I don't need to accept responsibility anymore? We need to understand, if you're a Christian here today, you are still responsible for the choices you make. You still need to take ownership each and every day of what you've chosen to say and chosen to do. And when you do that, God will bless you, not because you're perfect and you never mess up, but because you're humble and you have a contrite heart, ready to confess where you've fallen short and accept his grace and accept his mercy. That brings us to our next point that I want us to see here. Not only do we need to accept responsibility for our choices, but also, number two, I want you to see here that you need to submit to God. Notice what uh, he says in verse seven. He says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Notice what he, he's doing. He's submitting to God for his cleansing and his redemption. He's saying, purge me with hyssop. Hyssop was a branch that often was used in, in ceremonies in Israel where after the sacrificial lamb had, had its throat slit and the blood would come out, they would take a branch of hyssop, dip it in the blood, and then sprinkle it on the altar. What David is referring to here is God's cleansing power. When we submit to him, we often think of submission as submitting to God in obedience, and it is that. But there are other ways that we need to submit to God as well. One way is we submit to his grace. You know, I have come across uh, time and time again people who are really have a hard time of submitting to the grace of God. They feel that they have done too many horrible things in their life. They've messed up in some big, colossal ways, and there's no way that God can forgive me. Pastor, if you just knew what I had done, if you knew the kind of decisions I made and how I've made a mess of my life, the, the, the lives of those around me, you would realize God can't forgive me. Listen, there is no sin There's no amount of distance that you can run from God that his grace cannot cover you. God's grace is sufficient for each and every person. When Christ died on the cross, it was sufficient for all the sins of the world, past, present, and future. There's nothing that you can do, nothing that you have done, and nothing that you will ever do that will ever be too much for the grace of God. And we need to understand that each and every day we need to submit our lives for God's grace to fill us to overshadow us, to cover past decisions that we've made. When when David here is talking about the sacrificial lamb, our minds should immediately go to Christ Jesus and how he paid the price that I deserve and that you deserve. But not only does David here point to uh, submitting to the grace of God, but notice what he says in the very next verse. He says, make me hear joy and gladness. Now notice this next line. I often miss this, uh, this uh, little section here whenever I read this passage. That the bones you have broken may rejoice. Did you catch that? Whose bones, or who broke David's bones here? He's praying to God. He's saying, God, I want you to cleanse me. I want you to wash me as white as snow. God, I want you to to do away with my transgressions. And God, I want the brokenness. Some translations say, when you crushed me, God, I want you to bring me back to the place of rejoicing. Listen, not only do we need to submit to God's grace, but we also need to submit to his discipline. Oftentimes, we love to talk about God's grace and his forgiveness, and we neglect or ignore the fact that God is a loving father. And God is not ashamed or afraid to discipline his children. Listen, I love my children. I love them. I would be willing to do anything for them and lay my life down for them. But listen, when they mess up and they come to me and ask forgiveness, I am quick to forgive them. I'm quick to reconcile that relationship. But they know that even though our relationship may be reconciled and there may be forgiveness, there are still consequences for the decisions they make. And in the same way, God loves each and every one of his children. And he is quick. The moment you you come to him in humility and you confess your sins, he is quick and faithful to forgive us and to wash us from our sin. 
But that does not mean that the consequences of our decisions in this life are done away with. Now, I want to be very clear here because there, there can be some confusion within Christian circles. This does not mean that God's discipline saves us. But God is in the process of maturing his sons and his daughters more and more into Christ's likeness. In fact, we read in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, it says this, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Listen, you at times, can make bad decisions. Decisions that get you outside of the will of God. But listen, God is right there ready to forgive you. And thankfully, he's right there ready to discipline you so that you can learn from those poor decisions and be better off in the days ahead. Listen, one of the saddest things I ever see is when I see a a family who either the children do not submit to the discipline of the parents or the parents are unwilling to discipline the kids. Because not only does it hurt the heart of the parent, if not then, later down the road it will, but it also hurts the child. When the child does not learn how to properly submit to parents, they don't learn how to properly submit to other authorities in society, and ultimately they don't learn how to submit to God himself. And so listen, one of the greatest blessings God can ever bring in your life and my life, as crazy as it sounds, is loving discipline from a heavenly father. And when we submit, instead of trying to shirk the discipline of God, instead of complaining and griping about the consequences and the discipline of God, we need to be thankful because it's proof that we are sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father who loves us and disciplines us according to his love, grace, and mercy. So do you want to make peace with your past decisions? You need need to accept responsibility for your role in those decisions. You need to submit to God, submit to his grace, submit to his discipline. But then thirdly, I want us to see, jump down real quick to the last little section here in Psalm 51. I want us to see that we need to allow God to use our past to bless our future. Here, what I want us to see here is David is praying to God, God, please forgive me. Wash me as white as snow. God, restore me from the brokenness that you have brought me to. But then notice what he says here in verse 13. Then, after he's been washed clean, after God has restored the, uh, the, the joy of his relationship with him, after he has accepted the discipline, he says, then I will teach transgressors your way. And sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and may my tongue sing out loud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praises. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifice of God or a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness and with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, and they shall offer bulls on your altar. Now we think, what in the world is David talking about here? He's talking about a complete restoration, not only of himself, but those around him. Because again, remember what we said at the very outset of all uh, of this entire series is your decisions don't stay stay with you uh, in your own personal life. They overflow into the lives of those around you. And so David's decision not only affected him, not only affected Bathsheba and Uriah, but it affected the whole kingdom, the whole nation of Israel. In the same way, your decisions will affect all the people around you that are connected to your life. But David says, listen, God, once you have restored me, once I've accepted responsibility for my decisions, once I've submitted to you and your will for my life, God, then I will go forth and I will use my past failures to bring glory to you. Listen, if anyone had a reason to hide their sin, it would have been David. Here was a man who rose up from nothing. He was a shepherd who then became king of the people of God. And then he was known 
as a man after God's own heart, one of Israel's greatest kings. But then he fell. And he committed one of the greatest scandals of Israel's early history. He took the wife of one of his most devoted soldiers and followers and then tried to hide it. If anyone had a reason to try to sweep away their transgressions, to keep it just a skeleton in the closet, it would have been David. Or even if he didn't sweep it away after the kingdom already knew, surely he would recognize that he had no room to to tell anyone about sin, to lecture anyone about righteousness or godliness. After all, look how bad he fell. But instead of carrying around shame and guilt, instead of just hiding off in the corner and not trying to live his life for the glory of God, David said, you know what? My God's bigger than my sin. And God, if you will restore me, God, if you will vindicate me, God, if you will just cleanse me from this unrighteousness, then I'll sing your praises. God, I'll tell everyone about how good good you are. God, I'll tell everyone about your grace and your mercy because God, look, you can save a sinner even like me. You see, oftentimes when we have weaknesses, when we have failures, we try to brush them aside. We try to hide them, and I get it. I don't want you to know about all my failures and all my poor decisions. I don't want to broadcast those for all to hear. But what I've also found is sometimes the most inspiring and encouraging messages that we hear are when people tell us their struggles, tell us their hurts, tell us their pains, and their, their fallenness is displayed, but also God's power and his mercy is displayed in them. And so often I've heard many Christians who are gifted and God can use it in a powerful way, and I see it and so many others see it, But the thing I hear so often is, well, I can't do that. I can't teach that class because, you know, I I don't know enough, and I I, made so many poor decisions, and and I I just can't do that. That's something for, you know, a a pastor. That's something for a deacon to do. I, I can't do that. Listen, God wants to use you in a way that would just amaze and astound everyone around you. He wants you to touch lives that I will never be able to touch. But only if we accept, hey, listen, I've made mistakes. Accept responsibility for your decisions. When we finally say, you know what? Yeah, I did that, and then I submitted to God, and he cleansed me, and guess what? He can do it to you too. People aren't looking for perfect Christians. They're looking for redeemed Christians who know a perfect God. And so I encourage each and every one of you, whatever decisions you've made in the past, whatever decisions have been hounding you and following you out throughout life, Make peace with them by accepting your role in that decision, submitting that to God, and then allowing him to take even our broken past and do something beautiful with it in the days ahead. That's the gospel message. That's what each and every one of us, if you're a Christian, you accepted the moment you came into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what you already did. All I'm asking you to do is continue doing it each and every day of your life. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you, I I beg you to do that here today. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. You'll experience a peace that passes all understanding that this world can't even begin to comprehend. But it begins with accepting the fact that we're all sinners, submitting that to Jesus Christ and accepting his grace and mercy and then moving forward in the sacrifice that Christ did on our behalf. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. You're going to have an opportunity to do business with God. Whatever he's whispering to your heart, whatever he's speaking to you, this is your time to worship him through obedience. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Wonderful Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, thank you so much for your mercy and your love. Lord, thank you that you give us a new chance each and every day. Father, not because we deserve it, but because of what Christ has already done for us. Father, thank you for for taking my past poor decisions and how I have messed up my life, Lord, and using it, transforming it into something that's beautiful. And Father, I thank you for each and every person that you have gathered here today. Lord, you have them here for a reason, Lord. You wanted them to hear this message because they're struggling with something. They're struggling with a past decision. And Father, I just pray that you would give them the courage 
to step out, to follow you, and to experience the peace that only you can give. And Father, we ask this all in Christ's wonderful, holy, and precious name. Amen.